It is great to be with you this morning. How's everybody doing? You awake? The early service wasn't quite awake, so I'm, I'm thankful for the second service that you guys are awake. Hey, I just want to take just a, a, a minute just to make a plug for the ministry that I oversee. I'm the college-age pastor, so I deal with 18 to 23-year-olds. And we have an awesome uh, college ministry, and we meet on Wednesdays at 8.15 p.m., not in the morning, um, in the chapel um, at the student campus. And we would love for you to come in and, and just join this body of believers. There's a lot of great people, a lot of great things that are happening. And two events that I want you to be aware of is that we have our college age retreat. This is always the highlight of the summer. It's a wonderful time. You build friends, but also you're just deepening your relationship with the Lord. It's $60. It's August 3rd through 5th. And you sign up by paying me. You don't need a, a permission form because you're all 18. Um, and so uh, you, can, you can write a check to the church, get that to me to sign up August 3rd through 5th. And then also, I've mentioned it several times, the Passion Conference, which is in Dallas, Texas. There's actually four different arenas across the United States, and they sell out. I've actually, um, I- I'm pretty sure the Atlanta ones have already sold out. And so they're s- packing out these stadiums, um, and, and we're going to Dallas, Texas. The cost is $100, which doesn't even come close to covering the expenditures on the trip. Um, But we as a church, we want to invest in in our future. We want to invest in in the college-age students uh, because they're the future businessmen and women of America. They are the future leaders of the church, and they're worthy of of being invested in. And it's an incredible opportunity. It's going to be an incredible time. And if you don't take advantage of that opportunity, I promise you, you're going to be looking on the outside saying, man, I wished I would have signed up. So um, sign up to me, and I really hope that you'll come check it out. So you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be starting in chapter 2, and it's in the the very back of your Bibles, and I'd encourage you this morning to be a note taker. Um, I never go to the grocery store without having my list, without having my notes, because every time I go to the grocery store, I forget something. I have to call Elizabeth. I have to text her and say, I've got five out of the six items I cannot for the life of, you know, remember. And he's usually in an aisle that I was already in. He's right next to it. Um, But how much more important is God's word? If God begins to speak something through me to you this morning or the Holy Spirit's just nudging on your heart, just kind of pricking your heart, write it down. That's important. That's more important than your grocery list. We need to be people that value what God is speaking to us and write it down so that we can remember it. We are continuing in our series, I Am Who You Say I Am, and this morning, if you call yourself a Christian, you are a holy priest, you are a holy nation, you are set apart in a temple of God, and we're reading in 1 Peter chapter 2, and to kind of set the context, um, Peter has just spent the majority of chapter 1, and now into chapter 2, encouraging the body of believers, and encouraging people like you and me. to to purify ourselves, to rid ourselves of evil, to to strive to live and to to be holy. Now, I understand that verses in the Bible about holiness and purity, oftentimes they're they're not well received. People think they're irrelevant or or God just wants to be a fun sucker or or, um, those are just there so God can make you feel guilty and and condemned and, and it's just for there just to to make you feel bad. But what I want you to realize and keep in mind is that all of these commands of of living a holy life is is to benefit you. It's, it's, It's to benefit you. Why? Because sin brings hurt. It brings hurt to your own life, and it brings hurt to the lives that you come in contact with. Why does God... Uh, not like divorce, because divorce brings hurt? Why does God not want us to live in sexual sin? Because sexual sin brings hurt. Why does God not want us to live greedy and be greedy? Because greed brings hurt. And so keep that in mind this morning as we we talk about these verses of of being pure. He's calling you to a higher standard so, so that we are not causing hurt to ourselves and to the other people around us. So let's read, and then we'll pray. First Peter, follow along, and your Bibles are on the screens. First Peter 2, starting in verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone... 
He was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious stone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble, the unbelievers, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning that we would encounter you, that our spirit would be awakened by your spirit and that you would speak truth through me, God. I pray that eyes would be open, that hearts would be softened, that ears would be open, and that we wouldn't just uh, leave here just receiving information, but God, we would apply it to our lives and that you'd give us the power and the strength to do so. In your holy name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. amen. So this morning, I don't have enough time to unpack this entire passage because there's just a ton of information and there's a ton of different angles that, that um, I, I could kind of draw out of this text. But there's one truth that I want everyone to leave here knowing, and that's this, that you are chosen to be a holy priest so that others might find God. God has chosen you, his holy nation, his holy people, to be a holy priest so that others might find God. God. We're going to be answering two questions this morning. What was and what is a role of a priest? And the second question we'll answer is how do we become a holy priest? And it's important that we start with the what, because when I said uh, if you're a Christian this morning, you are a holy priest, a lot of you envisioned yourselves in black suits with a white collar and a life of celibacy, um, and, and where people come to you and they confess their sins, and, and then you forgive them. But that's not the holy priest that God is calling us to this morning. When we look at the Old Testament of the role of a holy priest, we see that his main function was to be a mediator between God and man. In, in the book of Numbers, uh, it lays out a, a number of, of duties of the priests, and, and priests were to teach the instructions of God to the Israelites and to facilitate worship in an appropriate manner. And, and when a, an individual would come to the temple where, where the Spirit of God was, the, the temple resi- or the Spirit of God resided in the temple, an individual would come to the temple, meet with the priest, bring an offering, and the priest would act as this mediator between God and man. The, the priest was a representative of God, and he is also a representative of man. And it's important to remember that the priest was given authority from God to minister to the people, and he also had access to God. This morning, you are a holy priest. You are the mediator between the people in your life and your holy God. And and in the same way of the Old Testament priests, you have been given an authority, and you have been given access to God our Father so that we can connect other people. We, we are like the bonding uh, agent. We're the conductor. We're God. We've got God in one hand. We've got other people in the other hand, and we're introducing. We're, we're bringing in, in an encounter to these, uh, the people in our life. There are people all around that are searching for something more, and you are the mediator. You are the conductor. It is your responsibility to lead people to Christ. Now, don't mishear what I said, okay? Uh, You have a responsibility to lead them to Christ, but we don't have a responsibility for saving them. Uh, It it is our responsibility to be an accurate representation of God's love and God's heart, and, and we have a responsibility to share truth to them and to love them, and and, and to pray for them, and and to invite them, and and to introduce them, but we don't have the responsibility for their salvation. If you confuse the difference, you're going to live a very frustrated life. 
But the truth is, is that God's job is to save and to convict. To convict and save. We as Christians, it's not our job to place conviction on people's life. Now, yes, when you have the the Spirit of God in your life, many times when you're around people, they will feel convicted by your lifestyle. But that's not you convicting them, that's the Spirit of God. And so we need to understand God's role, and we need to understand our role. Our role is to love them, to share truth, to show mercy, to lead them, to, to, to lead them to an encounter, to invite them, to, to speak into their lives. God's role is to save them, it's to convict and to save them, and to, 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 to bring them into that relationship. Yeah, oftentimes we like to pass off responsibilities. You know, it's like, well, as soon as I say, well, you're not responsible for anybody's salvation, we're like, oh, good, I'm not responsible for it. But this morning, we are responsible to something, and we cannot ignore that too. I can lead my horse to the water, but I can't make him drink. Jesus was and is the perfect example of what a priest looks like. In fact, the Bible calls him the great high priest. Everywhere Jesus went, he was taking man and he was connecting them with God. He was leading them to an encounter with his heavenly father. And not only was Jesus the the great high priest and a priest, Jesus was the temple of God where the the spirit resided. And and, um, in John chapter 2, Jesus refers to himself as the temple of God, and he tells the Pharisees this. He says, if you destroy this temple, speaking of his body, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. And the Pharisees are all confused. They're like, Jesus, you, you are on something. You are smoking something because the, the, the temple, it took over 70 years to build If it were to get torn down, there's no way that you could rebuild it. But they didn't understand that Jesus was talking of himself. He's prophesying of his resurrection. He's saying, yes, the Spirit of God used to reside in a building, but now it resides in me. And as you tear me down, I will rise again. I I will have a resurrection. Because Jesus was both priest and the temple, people encountered God through him. In in verses 4 through 6, it could sound a little weird uh, when you read them at first, but this morning, let's take a look, and and I'll try to to bring some clarity to this. Verse 4 says, as you come to him, being Jesus, okay, as you come to Jesus, the living stone, who was rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, the one who trusts in Jesus, will never be put to shame. You see, in the Old Testament, the, the Spirit of God resided in the temple, and the temple was made of stones. They were dead stones. But Jesus shows up on scene, and, and he says, I am a living stone. And he becomes the living stone, and not just any living stone. I, he's the living cornerstone. Now, what's important about the cornerstone? When, when you're building a building, and you lay the first stone, you, you lay the cornerstone first, and it has to be in the absolute perfect place. Because everything else that you build goes off of that point of reference. Every brick that is laid, every stone that is laid, goes off of that point of reference of this cornerstone that is right and true, and it's in the perfect position. I don't know if you guys read the article, but about 12 days ago in the Des Moines Register, um, there's a big construction, uh uh-oh, a big whoops, uh, up on Interstate 35 and Highway 30 in Ames, where there's the, the Clover intersection. There's been accidents, there's been deaths, there's been tankers. Uh, DOT says that there's 44,000 cars that pass through this intersection a day. I mean, it's, it's a high traffic area. And in order to make it safer, they're making a flyover pass. You can go ahead and throw up those pictures. They're, they're making this big flyover instead of having people slow down and try to gain speed within 75 yards. And um, the problem is, is that at some point, the anchor sleeves got moved around, and they built these six piers at the wrong elevation. And now, because these piers are, are, were built, a $23 million project, right? You'd think you'd be like, yeah, we're going to double check that one. And, and now, because these piers have been built at the wrong elevation, they're having to jackhammer each of the piers. 
There's six of them, and it's taking two weeks to get through one of them. That's a three-month mistake, all because they were lined up off of the wrong point of reference. Let me tell you this morning, if you are not lining up your life with Jesus Christ, the living cornerstone, you're going to build, you're going to build, and you're going to build, and you're going to get to a point where you realize this is wrong. This is not right. We, as Christians, align ourselves as living stones with the living cornerstone. You are the temple of God. You have the Spirit of God in your life. Because there's no longer a a, a physical temple, because we no longer have the Ark of the Covenant, because there's no longer the Holy of Holies, now we carry the Spirit of God. People come to us to experience the power and the presence of God. We act as a mediator where we say, hey, I know God, you don't, let's meet. You are the mediator. People are experiencing God through you. Now that we know the role of a priest and we see our our role as living stones, it's important that we know how to become holy priests. Verse 1 gives us the step, and verse 2 tells us how to take it. Verse 1 says this, Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. See, Peter instructs us to rid ourselves of all these impurities, rid ourselves of all these things. Why? Not so that we can boast that we're better. Not so that we can look down at the world because they're not like us. Listen, I expect the world to behave the way the world does. You shouldn't be surprised when someone flips you off. You shouldn't be surprised when someone's rude to you. You shouldn't be surprised when, when, when things in your coworkers and... Listen, you can't spake a baby for doing what a baby knows what to do. It poops and it cries. In the same way, if they don't know that they are called to a higher standard of living, if they don't know that there's a God that loves them and wants to change them, then, then why are we just spanking the world? That's, there's a lot of condemnation that, that comes from Christians that, that look down. God doesn't call us to, to become a holy priest so that, that we can say that we're better. God is calling us to be, to be holy and pure because he understands that sin brings hurt, pain, and suffering. And he doesn't want you to be a contributor to that. He doesn't want you to bring hurt and pain and suffering in your life or anyone else. See, I used to teach this little math equation where sin equals opportunity plus desire. Sin equals the opportunity to sin plus the desire to sin. And it's very simple. If you just take away the equation, you don't get sin. So you, you remove the opportunity, right? And, and, and that's a, a great thing to do. We, we, we run from the appearance of evil. Paul says, run from your youthful lusts. The youthful lust he's talking about is like, okay, you were young in Christ, but now you have been matured. Now you have seen the light. We run from those things, and we remove the opportunity to sin, and you won't sin as much, right? And that's a great place to start. But how many know that that no matter how far you run, no matter how long you run, Satan is not going to give up easy. Satan is persistent. He's crafty. He's going to find you, and he's going to find you in a moment where you're just worn out. You're, you're, you're dog-tired from running away from the opportunity. Eliminating opportunities to sin is a good thing, but it's a temporary fix. But if we change our desires, that's a more permanent fix. When we allow God, by his word, to come into our lives and, and change our heart, to change our desire, that way when Satan comes to us and says, hey, do this, hey, do this, I don't even crave that. You've got the wrong dish there, Satan. That doesn't e- that's not even appealing to me because my desires have been changed. Who are you? How did Jesus overcome Satan I- in the wilderness? He was led of the Spirit, full by the Spirit, and when Satan tempts him the three different times, he says, the Holy Scriptures say, the Word of God says, if, if we want to be a holy person, we need to fill ourselves with the holy God. We need to fill ourselves with the holy scriptures. And if you've ever div, di, if you dove, div, dive, dove, dip, dive, if you've ever submerged yourself in the word of God, 
you would realize that, that God's word is alive, that it's powerful. There's no other book that has ever changed more lives than the word of God, and yet we let it sit on our counter and collect dust. When, when, you, when you really read the entirety of the Bible and not just pick and choose what you want to hear and what you, you, you want to, to focus on, when you read the entirety of it, you begin to see this beautifully and masterfully woven book full of wisdom and hope and love and forgiveness, and it begins to change you. It begins to change your desires. It begins to purify us. Peter spends a lot of time in these verses and these chapters stressing the importance of living holy. And in our culture, I'm afraid that we have dumbed down the importance of this truth. And it's leaked into our churches. We, we have grown comfortable with our relationship with sin. One of the lies that Satan begins to, to tell us is that your holiness only affects you. That your sin only affects you. But the truth is, is that your holiness affects everyone that you come in contact with. Don't ever believe that your sin, your private sin, your, your public sin, that your holiness is only about you. It is about the whole world, and our holiness affects every aspect of our lives. Now this this past week, I was doing some reading and thinking about electricity. Does anybody here know what the most conductive um, conductor of uh, electricity is? Not copper. Not gold. Silver. I thought it was gold, but it's silver. The top three uh, like most conductive substances are silver, then copper, and gold. I always thought it was gold because um, I've, I've got a gold wedding band, and um, when I was working with electricity, I had an electrician like, dude, you better take that off. You could have a current jump, and your finger just go, you, you know, you could be unmarried in just a second, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Don't get any ideas, guys. <laughs> okay? But, but silver is the most conductive, and, and mostly uh, electricians and, and electricity is run through copper and aluminum. aluminum. Uh, because I'm struggling with my words. That was one of the words I couldn't say as a kid, was aluminum. Um, but th they typically use copper and aluminum because it's cheaper than silver and gold, right? And, and as I was reading about electricity and how it flows, I, I was reading in several different places where it talked about the importance where of, of connectivity, the importance of, of where you connect wires and how uh, if there's a poor connection or, or there's something obstructing that co connection, uh, that it slows the resistance, it slows the flow down, and, and, and it's like a governed sense of the electricity flowing through it. And then copper can go through this process called oxidation. I'm sure you're familiar, you've seen pennies that have turned green. And, and that's the process of oxidation. Probably the most famous example of oxidation is the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is this giant woman made out of copper, right? And it's turned green, and we've tried to clean it, but it's, it's just oxidized. Now, now, stick with me. God is like this pure copper wire. He's pure in nature. He's holy. There's absolutely everything that is pure in, in, in God's nature, and he's like this pure wire. And we have a sinful nature, and we have sinned. And we're constantly fighting oxidation that's happening in our lives. We're constantly fighting this green stuff that begins to overtake the copper. And, and when we connect ourselves to God, our oxidation, our sin, slows the flow. It's not that electricity won't flow through. It's not that it won't transfer. It's not that God won't, won't work through you, but it's at a governed pace. It's at, it's at a restricted flow. Imagine if we became serious enough in our holiness that, that we completely removed the oxidation, that we completely ridded ourselves of sin, that we were so holy that we is the purest connection where God's holy love would just flow through you in an unrestricted manner. You know, I, I think of... Um, uh, Peter, 
In, in, in the, the, the book of Acts, chapter 5, he, he's walking, and, and his, his shadow just touches someone, and they're healed. And, and I believe that we can obtain that same level of holiness where it affects the atmosphere and where God is so full and rich in our lives that it not just affects our lives, it not just affects our relationships, not just our households, but everywhere we go. I believe that we can become like Peter, where we're walking so pure and full and just purely connected with Christ that our atmosphere begins to change. But could it be that our flirtatious relationship with sin is restricting the flow? Yeah, there's good works that are flowing through us. Yeah, God is doing things through us, but is it governed? God, help us in this moment to see your holiness. Too often, we, we, we go to men to find out what is permissible and what's not. We, we go to, to men and, and, and we say, oh, can I watch this? Can I do this? Can I this or that? You are the temple of God. God's spirit is meant to reside in you, to dwell within you. Meant to be pure and holy. You are the temple of God. Stop looking to man for what's right or wrong. Go to God. Do you think that God would indulge in the same entertainment that you do? Do you think that God would sit down on the couch and laugh at the things that we laugh at? We have grown too comfortable with this oxidation, with this sin, and and we've deceived ourselves because the electricity is still flowing, but it's governed. God has more for us. Now, now you say, oh, this, this, uh, this is stepping on my toes. I don't like this. You're being pretty preachy, pretty con- condemning uh, towards me, right? Condemning. There we go, right? Listen, I have not mentioned one specific sin this morning. I haven't mentioned one TV show. I haven't mentioned one band that you need to stop listening to. I haven't listened or mentioned any any movie. I haven't mentioned any specific sin. And if God is knocking on your heart about something that needs to change, that's not me speaking. That's the Holy Spirit. You can't dismiss it and say, Austin, you're just placing your convictions on me. No, those are not my convictions. Those are the Holy Spirit. Isaiah, one of the most holy prophets ever, when he gets in the presence of God, he says, holy, 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 woe is me, an unclean man. When we start comparing ourselves and we look to the holiness of other people, we we kill our compassion for them. I might stack up pretty good against my neighbors. I might stack up pretty good against some of you. But if I uh, compare myself uh, to, to someone else's sin, what it does is it robs me of my compassion for them. Because all of a sudden I've puffed myself up. I'm good. How could you ever do that? Stop comparing yourself to, to, to your neighbors, to, to whoever it might be, and start comparing yourself to Jesus Christ, and you realize just how impure you are. You realize just how much oxidation has happened on your wire. You realize just how, how much more cleanliness God is calling us to. Your holiness affects people's connection to God. If we are the connector, if we are the mediator, your holiness affects that. I'm not going to get into this a lot, but we live in the age of the church, the church age, or some people call it the, the, the age of the spirit. Okay, when, when the fall of man happened, Adam and Eve sinned, that ushered in the present evil age. It, it ushered in sin and death, where, where sin and death were in the world. But when Jesus came, he ushered in this new kingdom, the age to come, this, this kingdom of heaven. And now we are living in the church age where we have this dualistic kingdom. We have the kingdom of heaven and we have the kingdom of earth. We've got pureness and holiness, but we also have sin and death. And, and God likes to give us these glimpses, these moments where we get to see heaven. I like to call them God moments. And, and God opens up these windows and we're like, wow, that's amazing. If you've ever been in the presence of God where you just, you can just feel them. You know, the Holy Spirit goosebumps or whatever you want to call it. Or, or uh, when uh, an example of a God moment would be when someone is physically healed or emotionally healed or spiritually healed. We, we have these moments where we see glimpses of the future. 
glimpses of when the present evil age will end and we get to be with Jesus in the fullness of his glory. This is where you guys come in. Your holiness ushers in the kingdom of God. Just like Peter was so attached, and, and all the apostles and the disciples, they were so attached to Christ, and, and they were living pure. He, he preached, and 3,000 people were saved like that. That wasn't him saving them. That was the Spirit of God flowing through him. You and your connectivity to God directly affects how you are ushering in the kingdom of heaven. And if we can get people to taste and see that the Lord is good, they'll never go back. If we can get them to see a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like, they're going to want some more of it. Our campers, they go to camp every year, and, and they just encounter God, and there's just this fullness Right? And, and every year I have a parent come up to me or Pastor Zach or one of the pastors and say, man, I don't know what you fed them up there or what they were drinking in the water, but my kid has changed. He's respecting me. He's getting along with his siblings. It, it, it's, it's like I've got a completely new kid. Listen, it's nothing in the Minnesota water. It's definitely nothing in the Minnesota water. We've got the finest water in the city, Urbandale water. That's right, Dale Atchison, Right? It's nothing that we said. It's nothing what the speaker said. It's spending time in the presence of God. It's being deeply connected. It's, it's when we put our phones away. It's when we put our Xboxes away. It's, it's when we put Facebook away. It's when we put our work away. It's when we put our family and, and bring them together into the presence of God and we, we, we connect ourselves. That begins to change not just our atmosphere, but the other atmosphere. And these students, they come back being sprinkled, having a glimpse of heaven, having just moments of God. And God's saying, listen, that's just a sprinkle. That's just a moment. I have an ocean full of blessings. I have an ocean full of my presence. I have, I have tidal waves full of that. And that's going to be the future. Your holiness directly affects your ability for God to flow through you. Musicians, would you come? In just a moment, I'm going to invite anyone here that would like to come forward to the altar for prayer, just as a step. Sometimes God begins to do things in our lives, and, and it's good. It's, there's nothing magical about it. it God, God can work with you in your seats, you know. God, God can work with you where you're at. But sometimes we as, as Christians need to do something. We, we, we express on the outside what's happening on the inside. You know, so I'm going to give you the opportunity, and that's not ev for everybody here. There's some people who are like, I'm just more reserved. I'm way more comfortable in my pew. I'm just, I'm just going to do that. But maybe God is drawing you, in, and you'd like prayer this morning. This morning was probably one of the top three most difficult sermons for me to preach, because I should be sitting where you are. I have become too comfortable around sin. I've become deceived in thinking that I might have specks of oxidation, and compared to other people, God's flowing through me. I apologize as your pastor. There is no reason why your college student or anyone here should ever come, encounter, come and, and have an encounter with me, and, and I'm not so full of God that I can lead you directly to him. I apologize that I have lived life in moments of my life with this filter, with this governor that's just slowing down God's presence and his power. Should have had Pastor Jeff preach this because he's perfect, you know. I just go down there and sit and listen. Would you stand with me this morning? God has chosen you. He's chosen me to be a holy nation, a holy priest, to be a mediator between the people in your life and God. Parents, you have a responsibility to lead your kids to Christ. I, I, I'm, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, I'll ask for forgiveness later, but, but there's a, a family in our church and, and um, they pretty much stiff-armed their kid to go to camp. 
That's a good thing to stiff arm them because sometimes you got to kick your kids and get them to sports practices. But if you're going to stiff arm your kid into anything, stiff arm them into the presence of God. And it's not that the kid um, doesn't want it uh, doesn't love God. It's not that the kid doesn't want to be a part of that. It's just not in his nature, you know, and then just maybe a little bit out of his comfort zone. I'm so proud of that family. And you as parents have that responsibility to leading your kids. If your kids don't want to go to church on Wednesday, that's not an option. You're the adult. You're responsible to them. If they don't want to get out of bed on Sunday morning, well, guess what? Stop paying their phone bill. Do something. You are responsible to your children. Grandparents, God has placed you in a role to influence your grandchildren, to connect them to God. And guess what? The best part is you get to spoil them while you do it. It's awesome. We all have people in our lives, friends, coworkers, neighbors, strangers, enemies, family members, that are waiting to be ushered into the kingdom of God, that are waiting to have an encounter with God. They are waiting for you to connect them to God. You are the mediator. You are the temple where the spirit resides. You are the vessel. You are the conductor. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads out of respect for your neighbor this morning? God is speaking. Allow his spirit just to speak. Tune out all distractions. That's why we close our eyes. I always want to give the opportunity for someone to accept Jesus into their life. Maybe you've never encountered Christ and, and you just feel like a crusted over oxidized wire and you've never connected yourself to God and this morning you're like, God, I realize that I'm a sinner. You've been knocking on my heart's door and, and this morning I'm gonna let you in. I'm gonna allow you to flow through me. I'm gonna allow you to purify me. I, I, I call on your name. I'm sorry of my sins. I, I, I repent and God, I trust in you. I will build my life on you. You are the Lord and Savior of me. There's no other way but Jesus. And this morning, if for the very first time you'd say, Austin, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me. I want him to come and save me. Would you raise your hands with every eye closed and head bowed? Is there anyone here? Yes. Jesus, I pray, God, that we would completely turn our eyes for this individual, God, that, that um, there would be no insecurity in the salvation, no insecurity of, of the past but he would know that when you look through him and you look at him, that you, he's been cleansed, God. I pray that he would repent of his sins, Lord, and that he would place his trust and his hope in you. In Jesus' name. Continue with your eyes closed. There might be others that haven't experienced God's presence, and you want to. You might be on the fence about all this Christian stuff, but you have been, God has been slowly nudging on your heart, and you have been longing to find out, is this true? Is this just a whole bunch of hocus pocus? God wants to reveal himself to you tonight, this morning. God wants you to have an encounter. And if that's you this morning, and you're open to experiencing God in a new way, would you raise your hand? This isn't, this isn't a, a commitment in any way. It's just saying, God, I, I want to know what's true. And if you're really real, I want to pray God's spirit just to have an encounter over you. Is there anyone here that would say, I just am open to God. Yes, yes. God, I, I pray for these two hands, Lord. I pray, God, that you would overwhelm them with your Holy Spirit. God, that they would have an encounter, that they would have an Isaiah moment, that they would have a Moses moment where they come before you and, and your spirit resides and, and, and begins to overwhelm them. I pray right now that they would feel just a blanket of weight lifted off of them and they would feel your loving arms surround them, God. I pray that you would open up their eyes and they would, they would have a powerful encounter with you, God. You see their open hearts. You see their open minds. So God, when they're ready and when they call for it, Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself in a powerful way. Now, there are many of us this morning that need some cleaning up to do. We have accepted our role as priests, but we have left out the holy part.
We have grown comfortable in our sin. We have grown comfortable with our relationship of sin. And this morning, you would say, I, I need God to cleanse me, to, to reveal things to me that are preventing me from being the best possible meteor that I can be. I, I need to crave pure spiritual milk, the word of God, and align myself with Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. I need to build my life on truth and holiness. If that's you this morning, you'd say, Austin, I've allowed oxidation to settle in, and I've grown comfortable, and I need to be pured so that I can be a better conductor, a better mediator. Would you just raise your hand all across this room? Yes, God. Yes, Jesus. God, I pray right now that your cleansing Holy Spirit would fill us, God. There's no guilt, there's no condemnation found in Jesus, and so we attach ourselves to you, Jesus Christ. We attach ourselves to the purifier, the holy God of Israel, of, of, of us, God, and I just pray this morning, God, that, that we would be pure, that our connection wouldn't be a sputtering spark, God, but it would be sealed, it would suck us in, God, and it would hold us, God, and, and that we would see people the way that you would see them, that, that we would love people the way that you would love them. That we would have compassion and mercy in the same way that you have compassion and mercy for us, God. Flow through us. We're an open vessel. We want to be a conductor, God, of your love, of your mercy, of your grace, of your truth, Jesus. So purify us, use us, and send us out in Jesus' name. Amen.